Kirkside. Yeah, they Grace and peace to you from God our Father and His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we ended 2022 talking about prayer, and so we'll begin this Wednesday night prayer meeting, the first one of 2023, talking about prayer. <laughs> hey, man. Uh, Lord willing, this will uh, this will conclude this series. Uh, I'll uh, I'll encourage you, if you will, to turn to First Timothy chapter two. First uh, Timothy chapter two. You can be turning there, and I will get there uh, in just a little bit. So we've talked about the who, what, when, and how of prayer. Uh, so we'll finish up with just a little bit more about where. Um, and I wasn't quite sure where to fit this information. And, uh, and I'll just encourage you, let you know you can relax. So the practicum was last week. <laughs> Tonight, just sit back. Enjoy. No, no volunteers will be asked for. Nobody called out. Uh, but I am, I am very grateful for everybody that helped me out last week and volunteered to read and pray. So tonight, take, take it easy. It'll be, it'll be all right. um, so where to fit this information about the posture of prayer? Um, there's a few things of that that might be of interest to us. Uh, we, we probably, as we grow up, uh, as children, we begin to learn some things about prayer and, you know, how to scrunch our eyes up and how to hold our hands and things like that. Uh, but we want the Bible to be our guide, Amen. and and there's no one way, right? So prayer is is taking hold of God, it's communing with the Father, um, and so there that can be done anywhere, any place, any time, uh, because He is everywhere, right? He's omniscient, He's omnipresent, and so we can communicate <coughs> with Him. Um, and we, don't, we don't have to look like we're doing anything at all. Uh, but sitting quietly or standing quietly, although we learned last week in the United Kingdom, you have to be careful where, <laughs> where you even do that. Amen. So the posture of prayer. So the Bible talks about a few different postures. One is bowing, okay, in Exodus 4.31. And the people have, uh, believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon their affliction, when they then they bowed their heads and worshipped. Okay, so there's the bowing of the head, right? Uh, and that's obviously a sign of respect, okay? Respect to the king. And you'll notice that a lot of these postures, uh, that's what you want to keep in mind, right? We're, we're having an audience with the king of the universe. And so when you uh, enter in, you think about maybe some, some books or portraits that you've seen before of when... Uh, the knights come before the king or the ministers uh, come into the royal court uh, before the king. What is their posture, right? So that reverence is demonstrated in their posture. And so there in Exodus, they bowed their heads and worshiped. Uh, kneeling, okay, we, we know that we kneel in prayer. An example of that is Daniel 6.10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Amen. Now, there's a few things there. So he, he kneeled upon his knees. All right. So the Bible is very specific uh, about that. Uh, he prayed. And, and this as he did aforetime. Right. That's one of the things that may be missed as we're reading uh, the story about Daniel before he gets pitched into the lion's den is they knew where Daniel was going to be, what he was going to be doing, and when, right? Because he had done it a four time. He had done it day in, day out, three times a day. So uh, that consistency in prayer is there. Um, uh, again, bowing our heads, uh, First Chronicles 29.20 and David said to all the congregation, Now bless the Lord your God. And all the congregation blessed the Lord God of their fathers and bowed down their heads and worshiped the Lord and the king. All right. Uh, here's one you, we may not do, especially as Baptists. Smashing the breast. All right. Luke 18, 13. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes 
unto heaven, um, would not lift up his eyes unto heaven. So, so that's the bowing of the head, right? That's looking down at the ground. So that publican was so distressed. What does that tell you? That the typical posture of prayer for a Jew was it's looking up to heaven. Amen. It's actually seeking God. Right? So we read in the Bible about God, make your face shine upon me. We are not to hide our face from God. That's why the Jews did that, right? They were always looking up to God. But here uh, in Luke 18, that, that publican uh, was, was so smitten in his soul, right? That godly sorrow uh, that he would not lift up his, so much as his eyes unto heaven, so much as his eyes, right? So what else is there to lift up? Hold that thought. We're going to get there in a moment. But he wouldn't lift up his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. Right, that, that fervency. All right, folded hands, right? This stuff and this stuff. Where is that in the Bible? Exactly. It's not in there, right? Um, but maybe uh, we've developed this over time. Uh, as a way just, you know, so we're not doing other things with our hands, right? <laughs> we're, uh, we're keeping them occupied, folded, um, so we're not, uh, we're not doing anything else with them. Same thing with eyes closed, right? Uh, also, uh, not in the Bible, um, but I, I also think that this, this probably, um, remember, the Jews are looking up toward God, and, and this is something to think about, like, practicing. Okay, just experiment with this from time to time, doing something a little different. Okay, mm -hmm. um, because you know one of the things studying this out, the posture that we sometimes take is all curled in, right? Amen. Like a scalded dog. We—that's not who we are. We are children of the Most High. We have a most loving and gracious Father who wants to be gracious to us, wants to give us good things wants to commune with us, spend time with us. He wants to hear from us. We are not to come to him like scalded dogs, right? If we do that, um, then what, what was Christ's sacrifice, okay? It's almost saying like, uh, I'm, I'm real, real sorry, and that's a work, right? If I'm penitent enough, if I, if I feel sorry enough, then God will look at that and say, attaboy. Uh, but no, uh, Christ has, the work has been completed. We've been washed of our sins, cleansed of our, uh, of all unrighteousness. And so we can come boldly to the throne. And so that's how we should do it. But this idea of closing our eyes, uh, probably not a bad thing because when we close our eyes, uh, what are we doing? We're not looking at the world. Amen. Okay. Uh, and the sense of vision that was the sense, or is the sense, uh, that Satan uses, right? So Lucifer, he's the, he's the well-lit one. Uh, that's things you see, right? Go back to Genesis. Uh, what did they say? Like Eve saw that it was soft, that it was good for food. Like it was a good-looking piece of fruit. Uh, looks mighty tasty, right? <laughs> this is, our eyes um, can get us in trouble, right? This is why bass boats have glitter. Okay. That's not for the fish. That's for us rednecks who like, that's a pretty boat. I like, I like glitter on that boat. Uh, what about on TV? I've seen now when football players, when they run out of the tunnel, a lot of them will run to the far end zone to pray before the game. And sometimes the TV will catch it. A lot of times they don't show it. But when they fall to their knees, they have their hands, like they're like this, mm -hmm. with their eyes closed. Right. Is, is that a posture that you? Yeah. We're almost there. Oh. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good segue. That's a good segue, Brother Joe. Um, yeah, so, so when we close our eyes, we kind of cut ourselves uh, off from the world and kind of focus our mental attention. So um, when we cut off our physical vision, that may be so that God can open the eyes of our heart. Um, if, you, if you look... Um, say I had you turn to 1 Timothy 2. Hold your finger there. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. Just a short ways back. Ephesians chapter 1. So Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. 
chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Uh, this is a good prayer uh, for the church, by the way. Amen. Prayer that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 17, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which we he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, two things there. Uh, so, Ephesians 1, 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. How does your understanding have eyes? Well, when you read things like understanding, uh, mind, heart, they're talking about the same thing. Okay. The Bible has a very unique way of, uh, it'll use the Greek term cardia um, in the New Testament, um, and the word heart in Hebrew. Um, so cardia is what, like cardiology, right? That's the human heart. But the, when the Bible uses cardia, it'll get translated a few different ways, because this concept of heart is really unique to the Bible. And it means the mind, the will, the emotions, the thoughts, the feelings, the desires. All of that is assumed in this concept of heart in the Bible. Mm -hmm. and, and the Bible says that our hearts have eyes. Open the eyes of our hearts. So when, when God opens our eyes, he's trying to cure us. The eyes of our heart, he's trying to cure us of spiritual blindness, right? Because we're dead and blind. Uh, first, earlier in this first chapter of Ephesians, we're dead and blind until we are raised Amen. with Christ, right? Then we can really see how the world is, and that's why we should have a biblical worldview. Amen. Same concept in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Okay, Amen. so that's a that's a blunt, it's a delusion, right? And that means that you can't see the way things really are. And the only people who get to see things the way they really are here on earth are Christians, right? We're the only ones because uh, we're no longer spiritually blind. All right, here we go. First Timothy uh, two eight. This is for you, Joe. All right. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, all right, without anger or disputing. So we lift up our hands, but we especially want to lift up our hearts. So um, I'm, I'm using uh, some notes from um, Ben Merkel on prayer, and this is what he talks about, this concept of lifting up. Okay, so it is a posture, right, of lifting up the hands. And if you haven't seen uh, the comedian Tim Hawkins' bit on uh, hand raising in <laughs> church, I highly commend it to you, right? So go to YouTube, Tim Hawkins, hand raising in church. Um, you'll know all about, you know, point, hatchet, high five. He's, he's got it, he's got it all <laughs> worked out for you. Uh, or, or if you don't want to go to YouTube, I just learned today that there's a God tube, um, which is an alternative to YouTube. So it's now my life goal to have like my YouTube algorithm be the same as my God tube algorithm. Amen. So I'm like 2% there, it seems, <laughs> after learning about that today. So this posture, so lifting up the hands is, is a posture, okay? Uh, so when Paul's talk, writing to Timothy, Men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Um, 
this, this is only in reference to prayer, right? But when we think about people, hands, church, what do we think about? Come on, y'all help me out. Yeah, I know you're not charismatic, so I'm not going to I'm not gonna blame you if you... When, when do people raise their hand? Music. Music, yeah, when it's song. But, like we learned in the Magnificat of Mary, which is a song, Amen. songs in the Bible are prayer, Amen. right? So, it's absolutely biblical when people do that. Did y'all think I was going in that direction? <laughs> okay, good, good. Yeah, so it is a posture. When we, <clears throat> when we lift something up to God, all right, um, here's the thing. When you, when you see a concept in the New Testament, and you think, ah, well, that's, you know, Paul just, that's the only time he mentions that. What's that about? Um, it is not a new thing. It, is, it will be somewhere in the Old Testament, all right? There is nothing that, the, especially the Apostle Paul, there is nothing that he wrote that was just new to all the first century Jews, right? Nobody got one of Paul's epistles and was like, no, nah, never heard about that before. <laughs> uh, there were no disputes, okay? That's why Peter even said, yeah, some of what Paul says sometimes, it's, it's tough, but it's scripture, okay? They, they were not surprised by anything. Uh, there were no concepts that were new. So this idea, Paul wasn't just coming up with something, hey, you know, try try your hands in the air when you pray. Uh, this is a this is very much rooted in the Old Testament. So it's a posture and it's a recognition of God's providence. For one, when we lift something up to God, we acknowledge that we are dependent on Him to supply our needs, and ultimately that we belong to Him. Right. So when little children come come to their parents, what do they do? Hey, man. Pick me up, right? Uh, this is the same posture that uh, when uh, Jews would come to the temple, okay, they had their grain harvest, and what were they to do with that grain? If you look in Leviticus, you'll see, depend on your translation, uh, elevation offering, ascension offering, grain offering, they took that grain and they held it up to God. Right. What they were doing was saying, this is yours, you gave me all the rest, but I'm, I'm letting you know, I'm consecrating everything that you've given me, every, every need that you've supplied, it all belongs to you, and I'm going to use it to your glory, for right. your purposes. Okay. So when Paul is telling them to raise up their hands, he's telling them to remember that they belong to Christ. They belong to God. And whenever we do that, the Lord, you've supplied this time, you've supplied this music, you've supplied this opportunity to worship you. We're giving it all back to you. It's all to your glory. Um, we're benefiting from it, but it belongs to you, and that's how we're going to use it. So it was a lifting up, right? The wave offering, they lifted it up to God. They would do that at meals too, right? Lift up a cup or lift up a piece of bread. They would they would lift it up toward God. And, and it was a devotion. It was an act of recognition and gratitude for God's providence. Now we no longer lift up our tithes and offerings. Everybody say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Because what would that look like? Right? <laughs> that, uh, that would not give the right impression. <laughs> in at Brookside in the 20s being way <laughs> Yeah. Brother David would have some explaining to do. So well, we got our we got our buckets. They're, they're good. No need to. But when we give the tithes and offerings, our hearts are to be lifted up to God. Right? That's what makes a cheerful giver. Lord, you've given me all of it. I'm returning a gift. Right? A gift that I'm not going to put into the offering until I've made things right with my brother, until I've confessed my sin to you, until I'm right with my brother or sister, I'm right with you, then I, my heart is ready, I give it all to you. So, what we put in the plate is, um, is just a, a simple token recognition that we're supposed to use all the rest of it that's left in our bank account 
to the glory of God. Amen. When we when we give to the church, we are telling God this we're we're being obedient, and all the rest of it is yours too, and we're obliged to use it for His glory. Amen. So. Uh, we lift up our heads, our eyes. That means we're focusing on God, uh, that attention of worship and adoration. Uh, and God, you know, will lift up our heads towards him as a father uh, does to his child. Now, this lifting up is also a condition, okay? Lifting up uh, your hearts to the Lord. Lamentations chapter 3 Wherefore doth a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens, right? So the hands are supposed to just match the heart. So if the heart's not there yet, neither should the, the hands be. Um, so when we lift up our hearts, we're giving up all of our wants, all of our desires, right? That's, that's what's in the heart. Because right? whatever, whatever's in the heart comes out of the mouth, comes out of the man, uh, Jesus taught us. We, we give up all of our wants and desires that they would be shaped by him. Right? So that's an act of obedience. Okay. Now, there is, a, there is a lifting up that's disobedience. What does that look like? Well, the Bible talks about that too. If you lift up your heart or your hands toward yourself, that's pride and vainglory. Amen. Right? Speaking of the NFL, right? Amen. We'll see a little bit of that. So, uh, lifting up the eyes could be to idols such as greed or power or bad ideas or wickedness uh, on the internet or high places. Um, so, looking at things that are not to be looked upon. Uh, and we could lift up our hands to do either good works or evil works, right? They're going to belong to God or they're going to belong to self world. So uh, lifting up a hand is also uh, reminiscent of swearing an oath or a promise, right? It's a part of worship. Think about the first great commandment to love the Lord uh, with all our heart, soul, mind, strength. That's a very physical, it's physical, it's mental, it's emotional. Uh, we have a very, we have a very impoverished view of, of the mind and psychology in, as modern. That concept of the heart is something we really need to reclaim as the church. So, uh, in, in worship, uh, hands of, can be raised. Um, prayer is very disciplined <coughs> type of worship. Um, and so the works, when we, when we pray, if we lift our hands in prayer, lift our hearts to God on Sundays in worship, we're committing the rest of the week to him. Okay? Uh, so we want our heart to be open uh, when we pray, when we lift it up, inviting God to inspect us, inspect our fruit, and judge it by his standard of holiness, which is terrifying, right? Amen. That really is a scary thing, because uh, if we've got the offering of Cain, look at what I've done, look at my good stuff, no good, right? But if we have the offering of Abel, obedience, that doing what God told us to do, uh, then we're going to be just fine. He will have prospered that, and there'll be fruit in it. Amen. Um, so, you know, um, we want to have all of Christ for all of life, for all of Sugar Grove, for all the world. That's how it gets done. Lifting our hearts to God, giving it all to Him, and letting Him work in us. So the Christian life cannot be privatized or individualized or compartmentalized. Uh, we must be consistently Christian all of the time, lifting up our hearts to God in every time, place, and circumstance. And what we don't submit to the ordered rule of King Jesus will be surrendered to the chaos of the world. Okay? Remember to live as Christ and to die as gain, Philippians 1.21. And the living is the hard part of that verse, right? Amen. The Christian life is the challenge. So we're to be faithful uh, with, with much, right? And a lot of times that's very hypothetical for us. Yes, I would, I would be faithful in much. Lord, if you would let me win the lottery, <laughs> I would be extremely faithful in all that much. 
Um, but we first have to be faithful. He's not ready to give us that much until we're faithful with the real little, right? right. The fixed right. monthly budget, no wiggle room. Lord, how, we can only make it if you make it stretch. That's, that's that faithfulness. That's what he can work with. So we live for Jesus um, with a cup of cool water to a thirsty stranger and being hospitable and ministering to those that God has given us, okay? Uh, and prayer is the way that a living sacrifice is resurrected to live and breathe again, okay? So a sacrifice, remember, a sacrifice is something that dies and you don't get to use it anymore. It's dead, okay? Uh, but that's the beautiful thing about God is he specializes in death and resurrection Amen. stories. So when we empty ourselves of us, when we are crucified with Christ, he raises us up in Christ and fills us. Right? And so when, when we do that all the time, Paul talks about praying always with all prayer, right? That's emptying ourselves and being filled with the Holy Spirit. What does God want us to do? And remember, prayer is not just tossing a coin into the fountain. Uh, like if God was running a cosmic vending machine, um, some litany of sweet wishes, just general topics and requests that are so safe, tame, generic, and vague that we would never even know if God answers yes or no. We would never really know the impact of his answer to our prayers on our lives. It would be barely recognizable. Uh, it'd be like taking vitamins, right? If you don't take your vitamins today, are you going to know it? Are you going to feel it? No. Right? No, you just give it for a week. You won't know the difference. <laughs> um, that's, that's the way our prayers get sometimes, right? That's why we run into dry seasons where we're not praying because we don't see God answering prayers because our prayers have just been so light and tame and generic. We don't even recognize if he answers it or not. Amen. So uh, the part... The time, the thoughts, attention, whatever it is that's lifted up to God in prayer represents the whole, all of life, the heart, mind, soul, and strength. Okay? And it's very difficult and it's dangerous to give up all of ourselves. So we try to find loopholes right, in prayer. We draw back from giving up all of ourselves. We try to hedge our bets. Um, and we hold back lest he actually answer with a testing or a change in our life, right? Lord, give me this, but don't let it hurt, right? It's the old blues song, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die, right? I want to cross over Jordan as long as my feet don't get wet, right? We want it, we want it in comfort, uh, we want it in style. So what we'll do, um, this is probably not good to teach you, is how to, you know, work arounds in prayer. Um, one, we substitute worrying on our knees for prayer, right? Amen. We don't leave it at the cross. We don't, we don't give it over to God. We put all of our mess on the altar, and then we scrape it up with a dustpan before we leave church, mm -hmm. right? Before we get off our knees Amen. in our prayer closet. Um, it's a works gospel, right? Lord, I want you to see just how uncomfortable I'm willing to be, how miserable I can make myself, so how I can wallow in the mire. Now just bless me more, make things more uh, appeasing to me uh, as a pig in the mire. I just want some more appetizing slop. Right? That's, that's what, that's what we're, a little finer mud, if you, if you please. Right? So that's when we stay consumed in our own desires. Right? Um, or, um, instead of worrying on our knees, we'll do this. We'll substitute optimistic daydreaming for real prayer, right? We, we lay out this list of our desires. Um, you know, we dictate our to-do list for God uh, rather than asking in the spirit according to his will, right? We describe all of our plans in great detail without any reverence for his plans for his kingdom. Amen. So that's still not trusting him. That's not being faithful. There's still a reluctance and a doubting there uh, that somehow we know what we need that God doesn't. And it's our obligation in prayer just to fill him in, 
right? Because he was waiting on us to tip him off <laughs> to what we really needed. Um, all right. So, hands raised, it says without anger or doubting in our text. Anger is that delusion of ultimate control. You know, that's why we get angry, because we want control. And we think somebody has wronged us. It's, it's a re reaction to injustice. We think that we deserve something. This person, did, they gave me the opposite. They've broken my <coughs> internal law. Now I'm going to get mad. <coughs> okay? So, and that's why we, we really can't understand the love of God until we understand the wrath of God. That's right? right. When you understand the wrath of God, You'll start to understand the magnitude of his love, uh, and that's where the fear of God comes that he, mm -hmm. he referenced. You know? um, all right. So, um, we pray with grateful hearts, we pray constantly, and we pray boldly. Um, in Luke 11, 9, the Lord Jesus says, I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. We've gone from no man seeks God, right? Remember Paul saying that in Romans? To a command to seek God and his will and his ways. And when we knock in prayer, we're knocking on the gates of glory. We're importuning to the Lord. And we're knocking louder and we're our praise and our worship is louder than those angels who are still singing holy, holy, holy. So loud and thunderous should our amens be that they cause the angels in heaven who are awed at the glory that we bring to our King. Amen. And I think with that we'll end our series <coughs> on prayer. Um, let, me, let me leave you with this. Colossians 4.2 so for this year, continue in prayer. Uh, just so happens this was from the morning and evening of January 2nd from Spurgeon's. It's interesting to remark how large a portion of sacred writ is occupied with the subject of prayer, either in furnishing examples, enforcing precepts, or pronouncing promises. We scarcely open the Bible before we read. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And just as we're about to close the volume, the amen of an earnest supplication meets our ear. Instances of plentiful. Here we find a wrestling Jacob. There a Daniel who prayed three times a day. And a David who with all his heart called upon God. On the mountain we see Elijah in the dungeon, Paul and Silas. We have multitudes of commands and myriads of promises. What does this teach us but that the sacred importance and necessity of prayer. We may be certain that whatever God has made prominent in his word, he intended, he intended to be very conspicuous, obvious in our lives. If he has said much about prayer, it's because he knows we have much need of it. So deep are our necessities of prayer that until we are in heaven, we must not cease to pray. Dost thou want nothing? Then I fear thou dost not know thy poverty. Hast thou no mercy to ask of God? Then may the Lord's mercy show thee thy misery. A prayerless soul is a Christless soul. Prayer is the lisping of the believing infant, the shout of the fighting believer, the requiem of the dying saint falling asleep in Jesus. It is the breath, the watchword, the comfort, the strength, the honor of a Christian. If thou be a child of God, thou wilt seek thy father's face and live in thy father's love. Pray that this year thou may be holy, humble, zealous, and patient. Have closer communion with Christ and enter oftener into the banqueting house of his love. Pray that thou might be an example and a blessing unto others, and that thou may live more to the glory of thy master. The motto for this year must be continue in prayer. I thank you for your kind attention. Let us pray. Gracious God and Father, we thank you, Lord. We lift up our hearts to you and ask you to open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, as we go forth the remainder of the week, the remainder of this year. I pray, God, that each one of us will have a deeper appreciation, understanding of your word, grow in wisdom, grow in grace, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
And may you strengthen our prayer lives, Lord, that each moment that we spend communicating with you will be sweet, encouraging, edifying, that your mercy will be manifest, Lord, and your grace will be glorious. And I just pray that you would continue to lighten our path, Lord, with your word and that we uh, would never falter in coming to you with the needs of our hearts so that you might conform us to the image of our Savior. And these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.